ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues and listeners, here we are again, another session with the Turbulence author, David Van Miller. And um, we're now on session 14, chapter 12. So we're on the last stretch, David, coming to an end, mate. And then we're going to have to have the big review and recap. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. At the same time, I will miss you guys. We're going to have to do something else together. I don't know what it is, but maybe a second book, although... The first one was tough enough. People ask me, hey, I've always wanted to write a book. My first comment is don't. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> it's, it's so much harder and longer. And it, you need good editors because, trust me, if I didn't have good editors, uh, we wouldn't be talking today. Yeah. Uh, but it was fun. And, you know, you like to accomplish things in life that are on your bucket list. And this this was and is. And I've enjoyed these uh, discussions and yeah. brainstorming and storytelling. and. Yeah, no, likewise. Here in the area. likewise, we're ple we, we're pleased you finished it, David. And this particular chapter, whether in the storm of bankruptcy, I don't think when you were writing this, you could have uh, you could have looked into the future and seen where the industry is now today. Now, you know, when I wrote it, it was now well March of last year when COVID hit. The week COVID hit was the week that the Airline Association in Washington was hosting a cocktail party to introduce me in the book. And they were inviting hundreds of people, uh, VIPs and, and someone in the industry and politicians and media and all that. And they had to cancel, you know, the meeting. That was the week of the launch. And that was last year, March. And the year before is the full year that I spent writing the book between here in Malahide, Ireland and in Palm Springs. Yeah. And uh, the environment was good. And, and the lady that helped me, Rebecca Collins from L.A. Hollywood, she's a screenwriter. And, and she did well. And the people in Seattle that helped me, because, as you know, I self-published. Uh, I didn't want to go through publishers and all the craziness and demands of a publisher. And somebody told me once, they said, we're used to that. CEOs don't like to use publishers because they're used to having their own way and telling other people what to do. I don't know. Yeah, but anyhow, it was a great there. experience. Thank God I had those folks. It wouldn't be the same without them. Yeah, no, it's always, it's always the entire team behind the star performer that makes that performance. It's, it's always true. Jay Wright, I was uh, talking about uh, Jay Wright this week. He's the famous uh, basketball coach for Villanova, where I went to school, and he's won so many NCAA titles. And he's a very down to earth guy. Uh, and when he recruits, he doesn't recruit the star player. In fact, he won't take star players if they're not team players. He won't do it. He did it once or twice. He's the biggest mistake in one year because the stars wanted to be the stars. And he said, I don't want stars. Yeah, I want a yeah. team of five or ten. Yeah, no, it's a, there's a lot to be said for that. And um, we're actually recording this the day after the historic win by England against Germany. <laughs> That's big days. <laughs> Yeah, you, you guys really went crazy. I saw a couple of the clips of people in pubs or wherever they were in the stadium. It was superb. And of all the things, do you know something? When um, Sterling made a mistake and he let the ball go back and Muller went through, and if, if somebody had said to me, do you want to put your house and everything you own on him scoring, I would have said, Unfortunately, I have to because I'm so confident. He's got, and he missed. I couldn't believe it. I know, it. unheard of. And that was the turning point. It was incredible. I don't get me wrong. I feel I feel sorry for him because he's been such an incredible player over time. But just to get that return and have the the um, the luck that the last time it happened was in 1966, which is when England won the World Cup. And when I graduated from college, Jesus. Jesus, so the omens are looking good. I the think omens so. are looking good. So with a little bit of luck now, um, you know, the next two games will make all the difference. Pretty exciting. Oh, it is, it is. Anyhow, so now back to the back to the bankruptcy. So you start the book by referring again, as as we have done in a lot of the book, to um post-deregulation as being the catalyst for so much change, but also starting an epidemic of bankruptcy. So i got to ask you why and, and how does that compare with today? Well, people expanded too greatly after deregulation. In other words, the, the reins were off and the horses raced to airports. Yep. To, for an analogy, and, and they did. And uh, I think every major airline 
at one time or another between then and now went through at least one bankruptcy. I think Continental might have done three, maybe Eastern a couple, TWA a few. Uh, and it's because the low cost and ultra low cost carriers came in post yeah. regulation with no labor agreements, airplanes that they could cut special deals in, newer airplanes, less maintenance, better fuel, and so on, and really muscled their way into airports because it was hard to get gates. And over that time, the, the majors and the established carriers made adjustments, hired B-rate people. In other words, new people were paid less than people that were under the old contract, caused a lot of controversy, a lot of union strife. And you, you take that over the years, and then you throw in a bunch of stuff like when fuel went crazy in 1978 and again in the 80s, and then around 06, which was Aloha's demise. So you had the oil crises, you had the Iraq war, you had SARS, you had the, uh, obviously the COVID most recently, but before that you had Katrina, which sure. damaged oil supplies out of New Orleans. You know, the list of pestilence that happens in our business, okay? So just take that as a starter and then let's, frame some of the comments by Warren Buffett, but I'm gonna put them my way because I've said this many, many times. Our industry is unique. I guess everybody says it about theirs, but why ours? Well, here's the answer. It's very capital intensive. Airplanes, two, 300 million, a copy. Yeah. At least the big ones. Capital intensive, labor intensive, with heavy union involved, not as, as much these days, but. Uh, very labor intensive and potentially contentious, very highly regulated. You can't find many industries that between the FAA and other regulatory bodies, heavily taxed. I mean, 15 to 20% of the taxes go to various taxes and, and the feds and customers don't really realize that. Highly competitive. And then with open skies and you can fly anywhere, new people can come in with lower cost. So it's, it's all those dynamics together and everybody likes to talk about their own industry. Find me an industry that mimics what I just said. Ergo, lots of up and downs. Now, bankruptcy in many respects is a good thing. It allows companies to reorganize and come out fresher and better. And there's winners and losers, right? I mean, the, the winners theoretically are the new owners. It might be the previous owners recapitalized employees, maybe, because they get jobs, uh, but you have to renegotiate labor agreements, pension agreements, aircraft leases. So some lessors get hung out to dry, other ones benefit. But it's the process of a reorganization through the bankruptcy courts. And in many respects, call it cleansing. Yes. Because over the years, the legacy carriers build up all these onerous contracts leases on airplanes. When I got to Aloha, we were playing twice the market rate for our 737s, twice. So I could get rid of all those airplanes and bring in new ones at half. I mean, 50,000 a month for an old airplane to 25,000. That's 150,000 to 100,000. Uh, so you cleanse and you get rid of ones you don't need. Yep. So it's, it's a, in many respects, it's a good process, but it is not easy and not everybody can do it. And they do not teach you this in college or graduate school. Yeah, but like like you said there now, that you know the volatility of our industry is incredible. In fact, to use a word that I I hoped I wouldn't use very often, and I try desperately not to use it, but it's unprecedented. The volatility it affects everything. You mentioned, you know, oil. You mentioned, you know, natural disasters. You've mentioned, you know, the the financial crisis, wars. Whatever happens, happens somewhere in the world where our industry has to travel to or from. And that exactly. has a big impact on the business itself. And these expansion efforts and people feeling that they should get bigger and better and stronger, they, it, it stretches them too thin. And like you well, said- Well, they the leverage point, it, Chris. They, they borrow. Yeah. So now you got a heavy debt burden. Now, money's cheap right now, but you got heavy debt burden. And one of the scourges that I didn't mention was 9-11, just 9-11 alone. Yes, and what it did to the industry. It's just a, a long list. And then you've got, pardon the expression, I won't say arrogance as much as we, we have to expand or we die syndrome. Yep. Now, there is a case for more frequencies and more flights because 
if you don't fly your airplane at least 10 hours a day, the math doesn't work. Yeah. And, you, and more airplanes and less because you spread your overhead, obviously, over more seats and more block hours. So that's that's the good thing. But if you pick the wrong city pairs or the wrong structure or the wrong airplanes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And the math doesn't work quite the same. Exactly, exactly. Hence the poor old queen of the skies and the and the yeah. and, and the three eighties and everything. It's all it's all coming back, you know. And most people did their strategy out of luck rather than out of uh, you know knowledge. So some have been luckier than others with the combinations that they've had. But in the main, David, the thing that you said there and you touched upon, you touched upon legacy carriers, but lots of industry legacies now. Have had to be put to the wayside and logic and sustainability has got to be taken to the fore so there's a lot more realism now and risk and 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 like i say the word sustainability that's more important than ever before and that's going to be taking us into this phase of bringing the business back better and learning from all of the the past you know to make sure that things are done in a certain way um now good leaders will appreciate those learning those learnings and lessons but I fear in many cases, there's going to be a repeat of some of those disasters. Well, there may be, Chris, you know, human behavior is human behavior. And I've talked about the human condition several times before. <clears throat> it goes back thousands of years and there's winners and losers and there's kings and there's serfs. And I'm not justifying any of it, but it's part of the human condition. And in the airline industry, it's hard to explain exactly, but when you're in that environment, it's like no other, and yeah. I'm clearly prejudiced towards the industry, but as a practical matter, how many jobs and situations you get into where you can fly around the world, meet interesting people, see the world, be exposed to so much in the way of drama and excitement. Now, if you're not cut out for it, it's not your yeah. situation, but if you are, it's not like going to work, right? Oh, I haven't worked a day in my life. <laughs> Just, yeah. Went out and I never watched the clock, never cared about any of that. I took promotions, I took demotions, I took relocations. I, I just wanted to, you know, I, I didn't think I was going to be the smartest guy on the block. I just wanted to be the guy that had the most knowledge and experience in the most disciplines in the industry. And that that's what I did. And that's how I succeeded. I certainly didn't do it just on sheer intelligence. It was a lot of experience, you know. But that's a nice, I, I like that trilogy that you just mentioned there, the promotions, the emotions and relocations. Because if you're, if you're open to all of those, the, the world is your, it, it, you can go anywhere. And it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful exposure, which in some cases, apart from age, um, it's, it's the best of all the learning backgrounds you can have, travel and experience. It's amazing. Well, you, you see the cultures, and I've seen the cultures all over the world. And I remember early in TWA days, I was a training guy, and we had about six countries in Europe together in Madrid at the Baraja Hotel, the Germans and the French and the Swiss and the, the Brits, and everybody was different. Each table was a country. Yep. And they were all different, consistent with their styles. The Germans were very structured, the Spanish were laid back. You know, it's just different culture. And, you know, a few years ago when I went to run uh, – the airline in, in Burma, in Yangon, and now I'm watching on television, and you know the soldiers coming in and killing people. And but I was in the streets of, of Burma in in Yangon just what three years ago, uh, running that airline, which was really sort of unusual for me. But I I wanted to taste that culture, and I spent a lot of time in that part of the world. But most people don't get that opportunity, so you can't explain world events to people cultural differences, attitudinal differences, politics, yeah, yeah. and all that, unless you've actually been on boots on the ground. I agree. I agree, David. And, and, you know, sometimes you sit at dinner tables and you, you know, you hear people debate and comment from what they see and hear on the news. And you, you, you do have a different perspective if you've actually lived somewhere. And I don't mean visited or on holiday, but if you've actually lived somewhere yeah. and you have to go to work, you have to eat with locals, you have to appreciate the rules and regulations of living in somebody else's country. All of those things give you a totally different perspective on life. I remember a story about this guy that parked in no parking spot in Singapore. And it said, do not park here. If you do, you will be punished and caned. Well, they took him to jail and they, they caned him. And it was a terrible, everybody in the world was against him. But he said, well, excuse me, in Singapore, it's the cleanest, safest part of the earth. 
Number one, number two, they had a sign that said, do not do this. Yeah. If you do this, this will happen. He did it, it'll happen. Like he can't chew gum and spit it out on the street. Women can't wear shorts. That's just the way it is, or don't be there. Yeah. It's The cultural differences are, are pretty strong around the world. They the are indeed. That, the folks who got caught up in the Middle East, like Dubai and Abu Dhabi, the, the guys flying the uh, uh, 380s, captains, and the seven fours, you know, they had contracts. I mean, good money. Kids went to free school there, free housing. But when the airplane left, they had to leave, and they had 30 days to leave the country. If you don't have a job in Dubai, you leave the country. There's no questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, just just coming to that, you know, you think I, I, sometimes I look at the newspapers and listen to them on the news where people are demanding this and saying you must accept this. And, and I think in some of the countries I've lived in, if I stood up and said I'd like an Irish pub on a corner with a Roman Catholic church at the end of my street, I don't think I'd have got a lot of airtime. Uh, yeah, so, well, you know, the world's a little bit different these days and at the risk of getting into politics, which we won't do. Oh, no, no, no. We, I, don't know where the, I don't know where the future's going, but it sure was a lot easier in the 60s and 70s, I gotta tell yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. No. Now, coming back, you mentioned Warren Buffett's statement and, and the, the letter that he wrote to the to the um, Berkshire Hathaway um, shareholders. The, 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 the quote I've got here is the worst sort of business is one that grows rapidly, requires significant capital to engender growth and then earns little or no money. And that, if anything, is our industry to a T. And again, coming back to the poor old Wright brothers, I think they would have been better off trying to create a bowling alley or a, or a new set of skis or something in some cases. But bankruptcy, 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 it's a word that so many people hear, read about, but have never experienced. Now, to experience it, it must be an awful thing, um, A, to be part of, and B, to be in the higher levels where you've got to deal with all of the ins and outs and ups and downs that go along with it. And just before we get into that, David, um, it comes from the word bancarotta, which I think is a fantastic Italian-English yeah. term because it's rotten bank, but that actually comes from broken bench. Yeah, it's to do with the the money changers bench breaking it so that they can't do business. But what a fantastic that was in Genoa, Genoa, yeah, Genoa Italy yeah. is where it came from. Yeah, what a fantastic term, banker rotter. I think that sounds exactly as it should do, and it means exactly what we we term from the bankruptcy. But now yourself, you've been involved in that, so you know all the players, you know the the responsibilities or the tactics or the objectives. I mean, do you want to just give us a little a little overview as to you know which one was probably the worst experience for you and which one maybe was the narrowest escapes for you? I would say uh, you know I had I had three I had Pan Am which was my first Sun Country following 9/11 which was my most successful it's doing very well 40 or 50 airplanes we we did new labor agreements really teed that up to be a player for the future and it is and then Aloha that was sunk by a nasty competitor with irrational pricing and fuel hitting $140, just an eyelash from having America or having United actually buy us. So I would say Pan Am was my first, so it was a learning experience and it was bizarre in some ways. Carl Icahn came down to see me, the, the wealthy buyer and seller of companies and Wilbur Ross who ended up as secretary of the treasury, I think uh, for a while under Trump. Yeah. And, uh, we negotiated those interesting agreements and ended up selling it to to uh, Tim Mellon of the Mellon Bank family. He walked in with jeans and a cowboy shirt. And I said, well, what are we doing here? But I'd already checked his bank account and knew that that was going to happen. But the, the board was unusual. One of the board members carried a gun in his sock. They were all very wealthy guys. Mickey Aronson, who's Carnival Cruise Lines, uh, Chuck Hobb, an ambassador, and uh, very well-heeled people. And I think the challenge there was they merged Carnival Airlines and, and Pan Am and Marty Chagru was there who had been with Pan Am and it was a disaster. And uh, so I was brought in to, to fix it. We had two different federal oversight divisions, two sets of employees and pilots and flight attendants. And everybody wanted seniority and Marty promised the Pan Am guy super seniority, which he couldn't do. And I had contentious meetings with both employee groups, bringing their families and kids and yelling and screaming. And I finally stood up and said, look guys, this isn't very complicated. 
whatever Marty said, I can't do. I can't do it. It's not right. You can't just take one group on top of the other. And I had already checked with a bunch of union leaders that I knew in Washington. I said, Dave, you, you can't do it that way. You, you got a, some kind of integration by some seniority formula. So that was pretty contentious. And then, you know, we were flying the, the Miami basketball team around and uh, the judge said, you're giving him too good a deal because the judge could do that in bankruptcy. So they snuck out in the middle of the night with some mechanics and took all the equipment off the airplane that we were using just for NBA stars, which was illegal. You can't go into an asset when you're in bankruptcy. And the judge walked in Monday morning, Judge Crystal, and he was like really mad at um, Pat Riley, who was the coach. Whether Pat was involved, I don't know. His attorney and I went to college together and he was in there trying to defend them. And, and yeah, that, that was pretty wild stuff. And then when we sold to Mellon, they wanted me to hang around, but no stock, no board seat. And they were going to have it run by three people, family members. And I said, I'm out of here. Yeah, so yeah. that was probably the hardest. Sun Country was fun in a way, but it was really hard because of 9-11. Yeah. And what we had to do, but at the end of the day, cutting a deal with the union at two o'clock in the morning in Washington, D.C., with the pilots, with the head of the pilots union, international, came to see me in another room before the meeting and said, Dave, I'll stay all night if you will, because we've got a problem with the local guy. <laughs> this is what you do behind the scenes, right? So I said, I'll be there as long as you. And we wrapped that thing up at two in the morning, and it's still one of the best labor agreements you're going to find. Uh, amongst pilots and uh, we, we really gave them a lot and they gave us a lot and we wiped the slate clean and things like vacation and so on for a while and they're still around today and they they're up to I think 40 or 50 airplanes they just did an IPO yeah I see their airplanes all around the U.S. and that made me feel good Aloha's was a totally different situation uh, because of the nature of Hawaii and no roads and bridges and rails and the competition, as I said, we got aced out uh, at the end of the day, but we had really turned that company around. We're making a profit. The government tried to shut us down. The pension fund or the loan that we had with government, we beat those guys back. And, you know, I'll give you two scenarios. The first one is you have to be able to handle stress and, and be calm. You, you can't, if you show stress, you're dead. And you have to be the kind of person that can work his way through that because every day every minute you're making decisions yeah that are like major decisions and in the bankruptcy process which i explain in the book i i equated it to and i put this in a, a newspaper article too it, it's like a, a final for the super bowl yeah where yeah. you've got the uh the referees are really the trustee and the judge and you've got a coach which is me the ceo and the coach gets the quarterback which is our lead attorney paul singerman and our labor attorney, Sheldon Klein, um, between those two, they really carried the water. But then you need the landskeeper, who, guess what, is really the government. And then you've got uh, the fans, which are really your customers and passengers. So the scenario is, is quite interesting between a Super Bowl. And that's how I felt coming out of bankruptcy at Aloha. And, and we came out successfully, and we were on a roll, and then we got aced out by severe fuel and a bad actor which and, and something you just mentioned there about you know who the lead attorney is and even where the bankruptcy is filed that has a major influence on the outcome or it has a major influence on on your the decisions you make and and what you have to do well uh i will offer a couple of interesting points most people aren't aware of the bankruptcy is all the same the difference are zeros i mean americans bankruptcy is no different than a lot of bankruptcy they're the same players. Yep. You, you have the same leasing companies, the same Boeings, the same Airbuses, the top 10 debtors that you owe money to yep. are the same. Yep. So they have the same attorneys. So, And there's a small group of attorneys that manage airline bankruptcies. It's a club. I went to a, a business dinner with a bunch of them in Miami, about 30 of them. One was, with, one was doing the United deal, another was doing the Aloha deal. And they're all friends and they're competitors because, you know, if you have your attorney representing the debtor, then you have an attorney representing the creditor. Yep. And my creditor was represented by Paul Singerman at Pan Am. And he did such a good job, especially managing my first time in the box with the judge, which was challenging. So I hired Paul 
to represent me on the other side of the table, theoretically, at Aloha. He was in Florida, but flying back and forth. And, you know, it was worth it. Uh, and it's a process. And it's, it's hard, but if you follow the mechanics, and I also mentioned in the book, when you end up in the box, which I did because the help of the pilots were challenging me on a deal and said, there's a better deal out there. And so the judge put me in the box and I'm getting quizzed by Alpha pilots attorneys. And I said, uh, you know, your honor, this isn't the right venue to discuss this. So, so I'm not prepared to answer the question. Yeah, yeah. Silence. And he said, Mr. Bamlow is right. Move on. And I also mentioned, and this is good in life. When, when you're in that kind of situation in the box, or you could be on front of a television camera. First, you know more than the person asking the questions. You, you just do. So decide what you want to say and answer. It might not even be the, the question. You also want to make sure you say what, what you want to say because you're the most knowledgeable guy and you're an actor on stage. And if you have that in your mind, you can get through any frustration testifying in court or on television or in the, any kind of shows where somebody's trying to grill you knowing that they have an agenda and you have an agenda. Stick to your agenda. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true enough. And and common themes running through all the bankruptcies, obviously it's like it's like any sort of, uh, I was going to say illness or cure, but, um, you know, at the end of the day, the business has got to come out viable, it's got to be cost efficient, it's got to be attractive for somebody to invest in so that it's got a future. Well, you're fortunate in the bankruptcy process, the, the way it, it works for those that, have not had the luxury is uh, once you declare, obviously you're in a situation where you're running out of cash and you got to decide the day, the minute, the hour, the time of year. I decided the end of the year, month after I got there at Aloha uh, on a Friday afternoon at three o'clock because nobody can steal your airplanes because nobody knows you're coming. Otherwise they could already have sheriffs on the, on the airplanes. Uh, so it's the timing of that in the press conference of people that you communicate with so the timing of that is important. And then you've got to run around because you have 60 days where you have the airplanes without having to pay for them. And that's the time to renegotiate the leases and you could get it extended. And you go for debt, debtor in possession financing. That's the short-term financing where people are saying, I'll jump in, maybe not forever, but until you come out of bankruptcy, I will borrow or you can borrow X. And I got like, 40 or 50 million from uh, Cerberus and Goldman Sachs, which was a very tough situation dealing with these people. And I got GMAC to give us a revolver for roughly 25 million. So now you use that money and cash coming in because you want to tell the judge the first day, you want to keep paying people, getting fuel, yeah, yeah, honoring yeah. credit cards, all that stuff, which is the first day orders. And then you proceed to to find permanent financing. And I ran around the country. I visited every CEO at American Southwest, who is now, of course, in Hawaii. I told them, you know, you're going to come sooner or later, just buy us. But Herb and Gary, I couldn't get to the, to the table, but they're all over the place in Hawaii now. And Delta with Jerry Grinstein and, and others. And we ended up with, with Ron Burkle after, I think, the 60th presentation around the country. Uh, and that was the permanent financing. So then you've got to negotiate with them and then the credit card companies and the banks and the dip financing. And then it closed like April 1st, as I recall, uh, of 06. And that closing was complicated, it was closing at six in the morning in Hawaii. And everybody was on the phone, all the creditors, every penny had to be accounted for. We had to pay the government back. American Express said, well, we don't have a deal yet. I said, well, yep. yeah, you do. I had to wake up the local bank CEO at six in the morning to get him on the phone to say, you're a lawyer, you, your lawyer has messed this thing up. So everybody's waiting. You hear a phone ring and she leaves. She comes back and says, oh, I'm sorry. I changed my mind. I guess I made a mistake. And bam, we closed and we were out of bankruptcy. But the process and the detail and the number of different constituents you have to deal with the credit card companies, the banks, the new investors, the fuel providers, the lessors, the unions. It's a very government officials. It's a very long list. 
Yeah, no, no, of course it is. Now, in the book, in the book, and you've got a section there where you cover certain carriers, but you've got the Pan Am section. You've got a lovely picture of yourself there with the uh, the casual jacket over the shoulder and the Pan Am logo in the background. Where, where and when and why was that picture taken like that? Well, when I was announced to come to, to Pan Am, it was a big deal. My first day, CNBC had me on TV. Uh, so it was a big PR push, yeah. honestly, and I had a good background. So they thought it was beneficial to get my name out there. So the PR guy, Jeff Krendler, great guy, was with the original Pan Am. His family owned Club 21, by the way, in New York. Uh, and Jeff was a great guy. He said, we need to get this picture and, and get your face out there and, and promote it, uh, which, is, which is what we did. And then, of course, in the CNBC interview, uh, Joe Kernan asked me a question. I'm on the roof in Miami, and there's nobody up there except me and a cameraman looking at me and, you know, the earpieces, like you see on TV all the time. And I hadn't done something like this before. So the, the first questions were publicly traded. They said they showed a chart of our stock. It was going like this. Now, I can't see it, by the way, but we're publicly traded. So I said, Joe, I think you made a mistake. Turn it. You have it turned upside down. Turn it the other way. <laughs> you see, they couldn't stop laughing. It was one of those things, how you break the ice to get softball questions. And that's really what we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it was, it was a, it was a PR. So it wasn't my idea to stand on that airplane, by the way. I, I was coached into it. It's, it looks a little more egotistical than actually it is. But, but it, I it wish I had great. that body now. It looks, <laughs> it looks, it looks good. And what, what was the exact year of that, that picture? I think it was 87. Or 97, rather, 97. That's a good pic. It's a good picture. Very, very good picture. Excellent. You know how I, uh, the other thing that I had to do with that picture is when I, when I left Aloha or Pan Am and we sold it to the Mellon Bank family, uh, which I've done every, every time, I had a party for all the officers, a cocktail yeah. party, just to thank them. And they gave me a huge painting, which was that picture, and surrounding it was white paper and everybody signed a note oh, that's nice saying thanks dave thanks for the experience good luck in the future and and so on when i left sun country and sold it in bankruptcy i had a black tie dinner for the key 20 people that worked for me black tie dinner everybody had to get it or if you rented it i'd pay for it and we had a dinner and believe it or not we gave out gag gifts at the dinner for all the senior people thanking them you don't find that very often. No, but I say it's a lovely thing to do. And, and and people need to be thanked, I think, because your career goes so quickly and you do so much. And then all of a sudden you sort of look back and you think, you know, was it really appreciated? I think so. Uh, I'm not talking about you now. I'm talking about everybody in general, you know, because there's so many people when they when it comes to the end and the end comes quicker than most anticipate. But when it does come, it can leave it can leave a bit of taste or a frustrated taste with some, you know, and they think, my God, I put so much time, effort, hours. And was I really appreciated? You know, I've, I've got some colleagues that I keep in touch with. And, you know, I say to them, you know, you know, you, you, you just got to put it behind you because it, it, it's it's far better to be better than to be bitter, because if you're bitter, you're never going to be better. And yeah, you know, yeah you have to remember that, Chris. That's that's good. That's good. It's, uh, you know what I mean? So I, I always I always think highly of people who've done something for people that they know have helped them or done a good day's good day's work or a good play on the field you know it's so important yeah I, i've tried i'm sure i've made some mistakes but i've tried to show appreciation wherever possible because it's never just you yeah and you don't motivate people by screaming at them i mean what does that accomplish i mean people get polarized because of it. it doesn't accomplish anything. maybe makes some people feel good I don't know about yelling and screaming but uh, you'd never find a Herb Kelleher or a Gary Kelly or some of those folks uh, or Jerry Grinstein from the D Delta days and Western days you wouldn't find those folks or General Lyon who I had great respect for he was a general ran the Air Force and very wealthy guy and Bill never raised his voice he didn't have to because he had the presence and he respected him because of who he was, not what he was. And, yeah, uh, I think, Dave, I think, I think leaders, you know, they, they come in all sizes, they, their cloth is cut accordingly. 
and they all have different ways. Um, but I think you can have somebody, you can have somebody who's very quiet, but really kills people with psychological pressures and bullying and politics and things and mm -hmm. the culture. And you can have some that let the steam go, but you know, they genuinely care. And once it's gone, it's over. So, you know what I'm saying? I think, and if you, you just look at professional sports coaches, they're all different and they all blend into, into the way the group seems to be more popular at a time, but they're all different. And sometimes to be given a kick in the ass is, is the right thing. And sometimes to be given a, you know, a pat on the shoulder or an arm, an arm round the shoulder and told something or given a bit of, bit of wisdom is also good. So, you know, everybody responds differently. I think the trick is to have the talent, not the academic talent or the scores, but there's two kinds of scores. One is analytical and the other is human intelligence yep. and communication skills. And everybody's different. So when you're trying to motivate somebody, there may be somebody that responds to you getting in their face. And there's other people where you have to appeal to their intellect or some other aspect to motivate them. So there's no way you can motivate everybody the same way. Exactly. It's, if the leader has the sensitivity and the sensibility to recognize differences in people, then that's sort of the key. And then managing those differences in such a way that you actually create a team. And I've gotten rid of folks because they weren't team players. They were good. Yeah, yeah. But they weren't working for the team. I, I, I totally support that, David. I think, I think that, you know, the term bringing back better, I think an awful lot more focus now has to be given to people who are responsible for more than themselves so that they they feel better prepared, they've got a better toolkit, and they're more capable to lead in a certain way that embraces everybody into a team concept rather than the high flyers or the fast trackers. And, you know, I, I think it's a different way now moving forward. Yeah, and I pop my head into the cockpit. I can't fly there anymore, but I always talk to the captains, mostly British and American uh, captains and sometimes Aer Lingus. And, uh, you know, chat with them beforehand. And they ask me a little bit about my background. And I point outside the cockpit and I say, see the guy loading bags? That was me a long time ago. And they invariably say, we wish our CEOs, of course, they say it about every CEO, but uh, I wish our CEO had that kind of experience from the, from the ground up. And I said, it does make a difference regardless of, of your, your background and educational levels. And I think far too many CEOs, and I've been a little critical about this, have not come from the industry. And because they were CEO of an oil company or some big Fortune 500 or 100, that they must have the same skills to run the airline industry, which is extremely complicated. And unless you know how all the pieces fit together in that quilt, then you can't be as effective. It's, it's an incredibly complex industry. Yeah. But, you know, we try to make it simple, like, uh, we say, well, you know, check in online and you've got this kind of fair board, check your bag. And, and people say, God, it's really easy way you put it together. Well, behind the curtain, it's very complex. But in front, we want you to feel like it's easy. We want people to get there on time, good rate, get their bag and be there alive. Yeah, a lot of swans kicking under the surface, making oh, it look smooth. Oh, that's, a good, that's a good analogy, Chris, actually. Yeah. Yeah, a lot, a lot are going on. Now, now, Dave, within bankruptcy, Chapter 11 and protection for a period of time, obviously it makes sense, but to, for, for people who don't understand that, do you want to just elaborate on why that has to be taken and what the benefits are? Of the bankruptcy itself? Yeah. Well, let's just start with the airplanes. The leases on the airplanes get either renegotiated to current market rates, which are invariably lower, Lowly at least in my case yeah. they have been. So you can better your fleet. You can make it more homogeneous. You could say, well, God, five different airplane types. I really yeah. only need two yeah. or one. So the airplane part of that drama, people think it's all labor. It's not. In fact, the airplane leases and other obligations on the financial side are at least, if not more important than in redoing labor agreements. Yeah. So you've got that piece, a very big piece. It's 15 or 20% of your expenses, the, the airplanes yep. uh, and the maintenance burden and the fuel burn and all that. The second one is renegotiating all your labor agreements to, let's call it today's world, whether it's pension funds. I mean, people have changed the whole structure of pension funds from where it used to be. So you got the pension fund issues, uh, and then you've got the uh, hourly rates, you got the work rules. You know, every time a labor agreement is negotiated, 
it invariably, you have to give something to labor just to be able to get it. So you give them a little here, a little there, another couple of pennies on the top scale, a change in the work rules, more days off, vacations. You go through the whole litany of, of items in a typical contract and you renegotiate them yeah. item by item. And uh, that has a dramatic effect. Then, of course, you've got your hanging on financial obligations, some of which you can discharge in court. You can lose some friends in that process, but uh, you can cleanse your balance sheet, probably a good way to say it, yeah. and some of the owner stuff that has developed over the years. And if you're doing okay and making money, you sort of live with it. Now, some people, very few, have done what's called a prepack. So you go to all these folks, which is dangerous because then they know you're thinking about it and they're going to watch you. You go and say, listen, I'm going to go into BK unless you give me this, this, and this. The leasing companies, the airplane manufacturers, engine manufacturers. But of course, then you're tipping your hand. So it's, I didn't do it and I wouldn't recommend it to anybody, but it's a way. In fact, I think Branson tried that with Virgin Atlantic uh, very publicly. I mean, you know, because he was looking for money from the UK government, but he was, his home was in Barbados or someplace. Exactly. And he, it, 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 so it, he wasn't. Hard, yeah. Yeah, he, he wasn't the politician's favorite. He was sort of in a jam, even though he obviously contributed a lot to the UK, in my opinion. But uh, yeah, he, he he talked to people bef beforehand. And, and today there's still bankruptcies going on around the world. Virgin Australia, I think, probably still in bankruptcy. It takes a couple of years to get through it properly. Airlines take a little bit longer than your typical average bankruptcy yeah. because they're yeah. complex. But the end result is you can have clean your balance sheet, come up a much stronger company with current work rules, current compensation, current leases, and a new lease on life uh, with uh, creditors, bankers, yep. and hopefully your employees for the future. So you come out a stronger company, almost yep. invariably, if yep. you do it right. Yeah. And that which is also why, you know, once it starts to go into a, a, a problematic period, that protection sort of ring fence is so important to allow it to survive because so many people rely on it. Now, where we stand now, Dave, and, and now just recently with this travel corridors with what is, is and isn't happening. So you take the US, it's almost open again. You know, everybody's doing what they, what they want to do, how they want to do it. It seems to be going, you know, bish, bash, bosh. Then when you look at what's happening here in, in between Europe and ourselves, one minute you've got to have a, a four or a five day quarantine when you get there, then you have one when you get back again, then you've got open open events where there's upwards of 20, 30,000 people allowed to mix, but you're not allowed to have more than seven people at a table. And I think if the politicians now don't start to get things right, and from a logical perspective, people are not gonna abide by this huge differential and it's not making sense. Things have got to now start making sense to move forward. And I think especially before this year ends, because some of the numbers are creeping up again. Uh, you know, some of the issues are creeping up. Some of the debates are there again. So you've got just this morning, you've got care home workers refusing to be vaccinated if they don't want. You know, there's a lot of discrepancy among what should now be a pretty disciplined path, you know, to everybody getting out of this and appreciating that, we're going to have to live with it. We're not going to beat it. We're going to have to live with it and, and try and bring it under control as much as we can. So with all this bad news, I mean, just over the last week, most of the aviation industry, the stock has dropped from anything between 3 and 5% now in, in, in 10 days. Now, well, I think the, the reason, and I've, you know, I've just been flying around a bit in the past couple of months uh, in the U.S., and uh, Palm Springs had opened up, no masks, restaurants open yeah. DC actually was open for restaurants, not everything like the hotel we were in, uh, the bar was still closed and the restaurant, but some others were, were open, but the bureaucracy is all over the place. Let me give you, science, remember people say there, it is not an exact science, you ever seen that phrase? Yeah. It isn't, but we should follow at least some semblance of science. Not every scientist is right. Fauci's yeah. not God. They're just, you know, they're just, people educated a certain way. They're probably a little bit leaning prejudice this way or that way in terms of their view of the vaccine, where it came from, yep, yep. masks, no masks. Everybody's got an opinion. 
So you got every mayor, every governor, every state and around the world, different governments all deciding different things. So here in Ireland now, my next door, beautiful little restaurant, you can't yet eat inside. Yep. The hotel behind me, if you're staying at the hotel, you can eat inside. The Grand now, The Grand Hotel. Now, a lot of people come from Northern Ireland, which is the UK, drive down because there's no border, and stay at the Grand and eat inside. And they came from the UK. Yeah. Now, our government says you can eat dinner in the Grand, but half a block away, you can't eat dinner inside at this nice restaurant. But That's by the way, you, eat, you can eat outside. There's no common sense to... Yeah. To what's yep. been happening, and now they put it back another couple of weeks, and yep. it's. Uh, they've, they've, got I, to I, get a grips, they've got to get a grips with this because, you know, I, I've just had a, a some of my a couple of my son's friends, and they were due to get married. They've put it off two or three times. Now they've got to do a, a smaller group, and then they're the same people that are writing saying, "I'm so sorry, we can't have a big event for our wedding. It's really disappointing, etc." And then you look on the television, and there's forty thousand people in Wembley. It's madness, you know. And there's people having parties at home when they should be out at a restaurant, which yeah, is yeah. safer. By the way, on the airline piece, to give you the latest and greatest, coming out of Palm Springs a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was chatting with the pilot. We had a two-hour delay in, in Dallas and a connection to D.C., and uh, they're running out of pilots. In fact, yeah. they have a shortage. So all the 737-800, 800, 800 max, there's a reason for that, pilots he's flying 100 hours a month and you know that's the max fa required max and a thousand a year so they're going to be coming up against their year in the fall because they're training like mad the 787 isn't as bad although there's a lot of guys in training but the 800 because it was grounded and now they're bringing it back and it's a lot of people don't realize you just can't take a captain on one airplane and have him walk across the gate oh, to yeah, another yeah. type and fly it so there's actually a pilot shortage at American. And it, it's hard to believe. And I don't blame Doug Parker for, for that because it, it's it's like the government, today the government put back indoor dining for two weeks. The people that own the restaurants have already ordered food for the next two weeks, and which is going to spoil. Yeah, all going to be spoiled. Thousands yeah. and thousands of dollars yep. because of all this moving back and forth and, and around. And the there's some push now not to have masks on airplanes and yeah, it's kind of hard flying for long hours with a mask. But yeah, the airlines are coming back. Well, the pent up demand we always said was going to be there. And it's there in spades. I took a whole bunch of Southwest flights when I was in California. Every single one was full. Yeah, yeah. every single one. Uh, now, the international is not quite the same yet for all the reasons. You don't know whether you can be in the UK or not. And then the next week. Yep. Take a trip to Spain. But by the way, if you don't leave by midnight, you can't get back in the UK. I mean, yep. these are bizarre times. Yes, no, they are. They are very tough, very challenging, and it's going to be with us for a little bit longer. But uh, again, one of the most logical things I think that should and could be done is if you've had your double vaccinations, then you should be OK in and out. And you just keep testing for X amount of days so that you keep on top of it. But that's it. Well, I have a, I've got both vaccines and uh, my wife. And in California, they come up with, uh, you know, you have the card that shows you had it. Yeah. But you can also download an app. Yep. And they actually have a, uh, like the grocery store. The yeah, yeah. yeah. You actually, a guy can, can go in and he can read yep. that little square and it shows where you got your vaccinated. Yep. The QR, vaccinated. Yep. The QR codes. I must say yeah. the NHS app and I'm in quarantine at the moment. But it's it's fantastic, you know. I've, I've got my day five, my day five test tomorrow morning, and if that comes back negative, then I don't have to quarantine. But I still have to have the day eight um, test as well. So you know, I, I can't complain about that. It's just that it it doesn't seem to make sense when there's so many other things going on. If you've had your double vac, just keep doing your own testing, and you know, look after people and you know, be aware of what's going on. But not all these up and down, in and out restrictions. It's crazy. Well, I'm, I have a certain view about management, and that is typically uh, bureaucrats and politicians follow a certain agenda, which is usually different than the agenda of a CEO or somebody running a company or a restaurant. They, they just they react differently. Their pressures are different, and they're driven by 
PL and service and so on, whereas a politician is driven by votes and image and, and well, how's the wind blowing these days? And what yeah. do we think? And uh, it's best to, and, and the, the, the scientists haven't been exactly perfect. Uh, and of course, they haven't been perfect. But I would rather follow a whole bunch of scientists in a room arguing back and forth and coming up with a common denominator than leaving it to politicians to say, well, 100 percent it's off a couple of weeks. 100 percent data, data driven decision making all the time. So 100 percent agree with you there. Now, Dave, we're almost at the end, mate. I feel as if I feel as if it's a, a long holiday and we're coming to the last few days and wondering what we should do. Should we go to the beach? Should we go to a, you know, a, a museum? Should we go to a special site or whatever? So we have to decide how we're going to finish after the next chapter, which is charting the best course for the future, which again is such a good title for what's happening now with this, you know, bring back better or bounce back better or build back better as some people feel it's necessary. But once we do this chapter, then it's going to be all down to you, which is what would you do differently? What were your best moments, your, you know, your highlights, your lowlights, you know, so we'll have a good little bit of fun with that. And then um, then, we'll, then we'll be doing a little wrap up. Well, I think that the tail end is going to be interesting for viewers, I hope. Very honest. The things I did right, the things I did wrong. The, the best people I ran into in the industry and perhaps some that I think less of, although I'll dance around that a little bit. And uh, mistakes along the way, you know. Never believe your own press clippings because if you if you think you're great today, you're not going to be great tomorrow. So exactly, you know, I made mistakes and and you know I own up to my personal mistakes. I made business mistakes and I've had successes as well. And my dad told me very successful business. He said, you know, if you're batting 50 50, you're going to be okay because you're never going to be 100. And if you try to be, you're going to be an ineffective leader. So just recognize your mistakes, learn from them, which I've tried to do, hopefully. And uh, and move forward. And at the same time, hopefully I can do this towards the end is impart some uh, thoughts on leadership and, and wisdom, because there's a difference between being smart and being wise. Yeah. Yeah. You're probably born being some level of smart and IQ. Right. You gain wisdom through the years. You, you're yeah. not wise at 10. Trust me, you may be smart, but you're not wise. A hundred percent. Makes us guys that trucking along the old highway for years gets a bit of wisdom yep 100 percent. so we'll do chapter 13 for the next session then we've got the epilogue which is which i like as well because you've got a lot of areas in there with you know corporate gamesmanship and political intrigue backstabbing how much better off we could be etc if people learn to share so that's quite a good you know we can cover the acknowledgements um, as part of maybe going over Appendix A again. And then we've got Appendix B, which is also there, which is good. And then, of course, what would you do differently? What's been learned, et cetera. So I feel we've got at least another three sessions in us. I think so, Chris, yeah. But it's going very quickly, my friend. It's been absolutely wonderful speaking with you. It's been, it's been enjoyable following the journey. And um, I feel as if I know the book Turbulence now probably as well as you do. <laughs> I think you do, Chris. And thanks for your courtesies. No, it's, it's really good. Well done. And well done, for, well done for starting and finishing that book. Thanks. All right. Look forward to seeing you soon. Take care, Dave.